Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Fago Maradian. The U.S. Strategic Command, based at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska, is supported by 184,000 men and women worldwide who oversee the nation's nuclear arsenal of land-based intercontinental missiles, ballistic missiles aboard nuclear submarines, land-based strategic bombers, as well as the command and control networks that go with the deterrent mission. STRATCOM also is the lead on space operations, global strike, and missile defense efforts involving U.S. forces worldwide. The man who leads the command is at the heart of America's strategic nuclear deterrent. General John Hyten, who joined the Air Force in 1981 after graduating from Harvard University, has served in key space and cyber jobs throughout his career. Before taking his current position in November 2016, Hyten commanded Air Force Space Command. General Hyten was in Washington last week and we met with him at the Pentagon. Thanks very, very much for uh, making the time for us. This has been a long time coming and I, I can't tell you how excited I am for the conversation. I'm sorry it took so long, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're sitting here. I am too. Um, so one of the things, you know, you've long spoken about the need for uh, agility given the strategic environment we're in. Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, changing technologies. Uh, and you want agility in culture, in thinking, in doctrine, in technology. And you've also said that the right team appears now to be in place to be able to drive that. What do you and this team need to do to drive the kind of change that you're looking for? So I am very excited about the team. Uh, and you look at uh, the Office of Secretary of Defense, you look at the Air Force, uh, you look at Air Force Space Command, you look at uh, my command, uh, the leadership's all right there. The Air Force, Secretary Wilson, General Goldfein, uh, Will Roper in acquisition, uh, on the OSD side, uh, besides Secretary Mattis, you have uh, Secretary Shanahan, Pat Shanahan. You have Mike Griffin on the uh, on the R and E side. You former NASA administrator. Former NASA administrator, who understands space pretty darn well. Uh, you have Ellen Lord. You have people that understand uh, the need for speed, the need for agility, and you. And when I watch them work together, um, I see a common purpose. And I see an understanding of the need to deal with the adversary, to deal with the threats that we face. And they're starting to move and they're starting to move fast. Now that leadership has to press down into the organizations. And I see that happening now in the Air Force. I see it happening uh, in OSD and I see that pressing down. But that, that's gonna be the next challenge. How do we press it down? One of the things the Air Force has done is they've pushed a lot of the authority, authorities back down to the colonels. Uh, that are executing the missions, executing the programs. And, and that's getting the colonels excited because now they have the authority and responsibility again. And they're starting to move. Uh, so there's movement happening, but it's just the beginning that has to continue and it has to accelerate because we have adversaries that are moving fast and they're accelerating. How are you driving that in uh, at STRATCOM? STRATCOM, uh, one of the things I've done early on is I've, I've changed the organization of STRATCOM. I've changed it to a warfighting organization. Um, we used to have, uh, actually just before I got there, we had 20 different uh, components. Uh, now I'm back to four. I have an air component, a uh, space component, soon a maritime component, and a land component that's focused on missile defense. Uh, that's a warfighting structure, and you walk into any other combatant command in the world, you find a very similar structure. So now when people come to work at STRATCOM, they understand that this is a warfighting command. We have to focus on the warfighting mission. That's what we're gonna do every day and allows everybody to align. And also maybe as important as allows the external world. So if you're an air component in European command, you know the air component in STRATCOM is your interface. You can reach into the command and understand where you have to fit. You don't have to go to multiple places. It also makes my job easier because I just turn to a single four star Right. and say, fix the problem. Let me take you to, I mean, you're arguably, without putting any other command down or artificially inflating you, arguably one of the most, of the most important combatant command because of its nuclear mission, its space mission. I want to talk about extensively the nuclear mission. Um, the Russians in particular have that escalate to de-escalate strategy where in a very early part of a crisis, detonate a tactical nuclear weapon, force the other guys to go strategic or to yield. And the calculation is that the other guy will yield because of, because of that. I want to get into some of the specifics of it, but more broadly, how dangerous a strategy do you think that is? And how do, does the United States and its allies need to respond to that kind of thinking that is now through war game after war game being inculcated throughout the force? So the, I think the first thing about that is that uh, 
I think escalate to de-escalate is a very bad translation. Uh, when I look at, uh, at my linguists and my intelligence folks and they translate it, they translate it as escalate to win. Not escalate to de-escalate, it's es escalate to win. That's been the strategy. <clears throat> and the other thing about that strategy is that strategy was announced by Vladimir Putin in April of 2000. This is not something that is new. In April of 2000, he announced that if there's a conventional scenario and it's not going well, that the, the, Russian, uh, the Russians would uh, consider the use of nuclear weapons on the battlefield. And he announced a 50% increase in, in nuclear investment. 2006, he said he's gonna modernize the entire force, be 70% done by 2020. Um, Dmitry Rogozin in 2014 said, we're gonna be 100% done by 2020. That's in the middle of the, of the downturn of the, of the oil industry. So this has been a focus of theirs for a long time. And, it, and we have to have the ability to deter all of that capability. So everything that Vladimir Putin said in the speech on the 1st of March, we have to be able to deter. And one of those things is low-yield nuclear weapons. Now, we have low-yield nuclear weapons in our, in our arsenal. Uh, they're air-delivered bombs. The B-61. The B-61. Uh, we have those uh, in Europe, and we have those to put on a B-2. But the challenge is, in, in certain scenarios, it takes a while for an airplane to get there. And the airplane has to go through a significant threat environment in order to get there. And it may not, it's timely, but it may not be timely enough to give the president an option to make sure he can de-escalate. That's why in the nuclear posture review, you see a continuation of the, of the theme of the triad as the focal point of our capability. But we also request and propose two new capabilities. They're actually old capabilities, right. and that is, a low-yield nuclear weapon on a, a sea-launched ballistic missile on one of our uh, SSBN submarines, and a sea-launched cruise missile capability to respond to another element of threat that uh, I won't go into in detail here. But both of those are to respond to the threat. So that low-yield nuclear weapon is to deter Russia from using that on the battlefield. Uh, we believe that if we have that capability to respond, they know we can respond in that manner, and they see that, and we can respond immediately that will deter them from using that weapon. It is a deterrence weapon first. So those are two new requirements, right? We're already in the midst of a triad modernization. You have the ground-based strategic deterrent, which replaces the Minuteman, uh, which everybody can agree needs replacement. You have the Ohio submarine replacement, which is the Columbia class. Uh, you have the B-61 tail kit program that's going on as well. And then the bill for that is about a trillion dollars if you include an infrastructure that we basically stopped investing in almost three decades ago in a mean, meaningful way. How much more money are these capabilities gonna cost? And are you convinced that after this two years bump in money, that there is the political will and the financial ability for the nation to meet this very costly, long range strategic program? So in terms of the low yield nuclear weapon, uh, it's, it's very affordable. Um, <clears throat> it's a very small number. It's basically just a modification to the the weapon that's already there, without going into the classified details, it's, it's a very simple modification to the rep weapon. We're going to have to work with Congress to make sure we have the right authorization for the Department of Energy to, to build those, but we can have those done in a very small number of years and deployed. Um, that will not uh, change our overall uh, nuclear inventory. It's still accountable under the New START Treaty. Uh, we'll mark down that path. The sea launch cruise missile capability, um, if you look in the FY19 budget, there's a grand total of $1 million in the FY19 budget to explore uh, what the sea launch cruise missile capability is going to be. That's because we don't even know the platform right now we want to base that on. A lot of people jump right to the attack submarines and say that's where it's going to be. It's going to be, but we have not made that decision as a Department of Defense, even the platform we're going to put it on. So we need to define that capability, define the platform, define what's, what it's going to be, and then put that program or record together. But in the overall scheme of things, that will still be a quite affordable program. The big dollars is, is, the, is the one you just described, the modernization of the triad. Uh, and, it's, and it's not just the big four. The big four are the Columbia, the high class replacement program, the B-21, the long-range standoff weapon that goes with it, uh, the ICBM, the nuclear weapons that go with that because you have to have a nuclear weapon infrastructure uh, that comes with that because all those platforms without a nuclear weapon don't provide a deterrent. And then the nuclear command and control piece that comes on top of that. Those are the big six. There's actually six pieces of that, that puzzle that we have to put together. And so we have to fund that. And the Secretary of Defense 
I love the way he just said it, just in front of the House Armed Services Committee just a few hours ago, uh, when he was asked the same question. He said, in the overall scheme of things, it's six, six and a half percent at the worst of our overall defense budget. The defense budget is 3.1 percent of our gross domestic product, a significant low. Uh, it is expensive. We need to make sure we guard every taxpayer dollar like it was our own. But at the same time, America can afford survival. And I think that's exactly true. That's where our defense starts. The, the one thing we can't ever allow to happen is the, the United States to be attacked with nuclear weapons. And so we have to deter that first before we do anything else. That's exactly what we're going to do. And the cost, as expensive it is, as it is, is still affordable for the security of our nation. Well, it's like Chili Chilton said, right? We know when people say that nuclear weapons are dangerous, he said, if you want to see a war without nuclear weapons, think of World War II, because that's effectively what, what you see. Absolutely. And, and the only thing more expensive than deterrence is war. If you, if you want to look back, you know, uh, the secretary had a chart that he used uh, in front of Congress that showed uh, how much of our gross domestic product we spent uh, over the last 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, I guess all the way back into World War II. And in World War II, it's this huge number. And in, in, the, in the early 50s, it's this huge number. And what's the relationship between the early 40s and the early 50s? We're at war. So if, if you think that's expensive, Imagine what a war would cost the United States in terms of treasure, bloods, our sons and daughters. The whole goal of the military is to preserve the peace. That's why I, you know, we have this, the old SAC motto is, is back in Stratcom. Peace is our profession. That is what we do. Um, let me uh, take you to uh, China's um, capabilities. We talk a lot about Russia. We don't talk a lot about, a lot about China, China's nuclear doctrine, its, its way of thinking. Folks looking, for example, at their South China Sea strategy is to create a bastion from which to be able to project their nuclear forces. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, China's thinking, China's capabilities, and how that's shaping your thinking. So um, China is, you know, one of the nice things about having a treaty regime, New START and INF, even though Russia is in violation of it, Having that structure with the Russians allows transparency into what their capabilities are. Uh, we don't have any uh, kind of regime along those lines with China. So the China capabilities are in many cases much less transparent and harder to, to look at and harder to understand. Uh, so you have to look at what they say. And they uh, state uh, that their policy is that their, their nuclear capabilities are a second use capabilities. And, uh, I would look at their capabilities and say, yes, they're structured to be uh, a second use capability. But then you have to look at what they're doing. And they're building hypersonic capabilities and, uh, and, and bombers that have long range uh, uh, weapons on board. Uh, they're building out a full uh, blown triad. Um, they're looking at improving and, and restructuring their strategic forces still on the second use construct according to their, their statements, but it's a much more significant threat that we have to deal with. And then if you look at what they're doing in space and what they're doing in, in terms of countering our space capabilities and their overall strategic posture, I guess in summary, if you look at China, all you have to do is go back to their open literature in the 1990s when they said exactly what they were gonna do. Why did they say that in the mid 1990s? Because they watched the United States in the first Gulf War. They watched us in Desert Storm. They watched the amazing conventional power that we created, and they watched how dependent we are on space, how dependent we are on information. Uh, they watched and understood that the strategic element of their forces, if they're going to challenge the United States, they're gonna to have to challenge us along those lines because they don't want to challenge us straight up conventionally. So they started walking down that, and they've been very consistent walking through that path over the years. And so, I, you know, I, as much as anybody, I would like to have an open, transparent relationship with China, with Russia. Uh, I would like the world to be uh, more peaceful. I would like to have better communication uh, with our adversaries. I'd like them not to be adversaries. But as the commander of STRATCOM, I don't get that choice. I have to look at their capabilities and make sure we can defend against those capabilities. Well, so one of your important roles is uh, the missile defense piece of it that falls you for the continent of the United States. Um, and all eyes uh, are on, obviously, the North Korea threat uh, that has accelerated a little, a little faster than we had expected it to. Uh, there are those who say uh, that our missile defenses may not 
be as good as we would like them to be. You're the guy in charge of them. Are those missile defenses as good as they need to be? And if not, what needs to happen to make them better? So just to clarify, I'm the coordinating authority amongst all the COCOMs for missile defense. Right. The person in charge of, of the missile defense capabilities is actually General Robinson at NORTHCOM of the missile defense capabilities defend against North Korea. But since I'm the coordinating authority, I look and I understand what those capabilities are, and I've worked that area for a long time, and I can tell you that the deployed missile defenses we have will defend us against the current North Korea threat. And I have no doubt uh, about that. I have no hesitation in saying that. General Robinson has made the state, same statement in public in front of Congress. Uh, they are built against that threat. They're not built against the Russian China threat. Uh, they're not deployed against the Russian China threat. They're really focused on the North Korea threat. And the North Korea threat has been moving very rapidly, which means if they continue to move rapidly that way, and you know, as much as anybody in the world, I hope that the, the current, uh, I'll say peace process, for lack of a better term, pays out. And I, and I hope that there is a denuclearization process on the North Korean peninsula. But if they continue to move the way they've been moving at that speed, that means we're going to have to advance our defenses in order to deal with their uh, improving threat because they'll continue to improve as time goes on. And this is just this, the historical problem of dealing with an adversary. They will continue to move forward. We have to move forward and we have to move forward faster. So when I look at missile defense, the most important thing I need is the need for improved sensing to characterize what that threat is and to characterize new and emerging threats. Sensing is the most important thing. The next best thing to deal with a new and emerging threat is to get better kill vehicles on our interceptors. Uh, those kill vehicles will be able to handle uh, a new and emerging uh, uh, missile threat coming from North Korea. And then the last thing we need is capacity. We do need capacity because as they grow their capacity, we're going to need capacity to respond to that. So that's the way I look at the missile defense problem. How do you deal, though, with the hypersonic threat, right? There are folks who look at it from the United States perspective that we did a couple of experiments that didn't work, we sort of backed off, whereas our adversaries have invested a lot of money in that capability, which is a very, very hard problem. And then if you add a nuclear weapon to that, that becomes an even tougher problem. Talk to us a little bit about hypersonics and how that changes both your offensive calculus, but also the defensive calculus. So the, the key to be able to respond to any nuclear weapon, doesn't matter how it's deployed, is can you uh, respond to an adversary in a way that they can't deal with? And that's what the triad does. So the first defense for a hypersonic weapon that's nuclear, the same as the United States, is our deterrent capabilities. And they will deter anybody because there's nothing that our adversaries can do about those capabilities right now. And I won't go into the classified reasons why that is, but uh, our capabilities will be able to destroy whatever that adversary throws at us. Now, um, when I look at hypersonics, Again, it comes down to the first thing you want to be able to do is see it so you can respond to it. Uh, and we have a challenge right now because our overhead architecture and our radar architecture is really focused at a ballistic threat. And so the first thing we need to do to characterize hypersonics is be able to see them. That's why I continue to advocate for moving to space uh, to build an element of an overhead architecture that can look down and see uh, the hypersonic threat and characterize that hypersonic threat right away. Whether you want to defend against it is a separate question, but you need to be able to characterize, attribute the, the attacker, understand where the attack comes from, and then be able to respond to that. So we need to have that inherent architecture to do with that. Then we have to make a decision as a nation to figure out what to do with it. But the rest of that question is that we have to aggressively pursue hypersonics. And, and I, um, I tell you what, we have probably one of the best people in the world that I can think of, Mike Griffin, uh, that's gonna grab hold of that and, and run with it. I, I watched the Secretary of Defense this week, look at him in the eye and say, you know, this is, this is our top technology issue. I want you to jump and I want you to go fast because this nation can go fast in that area. So Mike Griffin is gonna be all over hypersonics and that's gonna be great for this country. I want to ask you uh, about war in space. You mentioned space about the need for an overhead architecture and the challenge to revitalize, by the way, that architecture is almost as, you know, it's not as big as the nuclear infrastructure, but that's something that you were former space com, uh, space com Air Force Space Command Chief and you talked about that uh, extensively. You've also talked about the dangers of war in space, um, that we don't want to 
but there are adversaries who are looking at actually prosecuting that as any other domain, in which case we have to prepare for it. From your standpoint, what are the best ways to deter a war in space that would be utterly catastrophic given its, its consequences, orbital mechanics? I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's very, very bad. We improve space situational awareness to a degree to understand what's going on in that environment, not as much maybe as we would. But talk to us about what are the best ways to deter a war in space. So the first thing to remember is there's no such thing as war in space. There's just war. And war is not against a place. It's not against space or cyber or the air. It's against an adversary. So if you want to deter war from extending into space, you have to deter the adversary. So that means you have to focus on the adversary. And I like the way our, our national defense strategy talks about it. Uh, the national space strategy talks about it because there's a very important new term that's in the statement of our response. If we have to defend ourselves against an attack in space, it says the United States will reserve the right to respond in a time and a place and a domain of our choosing. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be in space. It'll be some way to hurt that adversary that wants to go there to make them stop carrying on into space. Because what we don't want to have is this huge kinetic battle that's taking place in the heavens. Because that's bad for the United States, bad for the world, bad for the future, we want to avoid that. So the key is to avoid that and deter that conflict from beginning, because that'll prevent it from going into space. Now, if it does go into space, the, de the concepts of deterrence in space are the same as everywhere else. The concepts are, to impose cost on an adversary, di deny benefit to the adversary, and make sure that it's communicated, visible, and credible. That's, those are the elements of deterrence, and those elements don't change. So that means we have to have capabilities in order to do that. So what we have built is a, a set of capabilities that is the envy of the world, that is massive in its structure, that is lar so large that it will be difficult for an adversary to even impact or touch over the next a uh, few years, uh, certainly into the next decade, but we have to now adjust that to make sure that an adversary can attack it, which means we should change from building small numbers of large satellites to more distributed constellations, defendable constellations, and we're gonna use all the defense mechanisms that we use in other domains as well. Um, and if we make it so an adversary can't attack us, they won't attack us. It's, it's the same war fighting problem as anywhere else. So if we walk into that, we'll prevent a conflict from going into space because I don't want a conflict to extend into space. Both of our adversaries, China and Russia, are developing a lot, a large numbers of long range conventional strike weapons that actually can have strategic effects because of their ability to deliver mass area denial. Um, and you know, so you get that kind of conventional firepower, it can have kind of strategic effects at the end of the day. Does the United States need to consider developing long range conventional ICBMs with area denial capabilities? And if so, is your command the right place for that to reside as opposed to residing within the services, which um, is, is sort of how that's conventionally thought of, even though for the other countries, those strategic rocket forces are considered a strategic element of their orders of battle? So the, the big answer to the question is, is a broader question uh, than just a STRATCOM question. However, the, the piece that is a STRATCOM question, and I have a, a requirement for that, is I have a requirement for conventional prompt global strike. Uh, STRATCOM has had that requirement for a while. That is still a critical requirement from, from my perspective uh, we're going to continue to pursue that, uh, push that in. Uh, you'll see the Navy being uh, assigned responsibility in the 19 budget to begin to look at how we're going to do that. Uh, that is a critical uh, requirement I think STRATCOM needs because some of the threats I just described a while ago uh, that, uh, that could threaten us in, in space and other domains, um, they need to be able to res be responded to quickly and our adversaries need to know that. And I want to be able to give the president timely options that don't go nuclear. Uh, I don't want to be put in the position where the only option I can give to the president of the United States is a nuclear option. That's not a good place for any commander to be. Do you think though that you need something like a DF-21 force to be able to project conventional power at range at that mass? So that's, that's more of a PACOM question. Uh, 
because uh, the DF-21 is a is really a PACOM threat. Right. It's not a STRATCOM threat. It's not a threat to the United States. Right. But I think we need a conventional strike capability, prompt global, prompt strike in theater and prompt global strike that we can uh, reach to from anywhere in the world that can, in a very short amount of time, eliminate a target anywhere on the planet. Now, I don't, I actually don't care how that is done. So I don't have a uh, a desire to push any specific concept, and that's not a job of a combatant commander anyway, right. but I do have the requirement for that capability. Let me ask you very quickly about nuclear um, exercising, training, nuclear thinking. Uh, throughout the Cold War, President on down would regularly engage in nuclear war games. A lot of folks would go out to secret sites uh, to practice what would happen in the event that something, uh, the, un the, the unthinkable did happen. Do we need to do those kinds of exercises? To what degree are you doing those kinds of exercises to get national leadership, uh, the political authorities thinking about these questions and readying for themselves in the event that the unfortunate happens? So we've, um, we've actually exercised that a lot this year. Uh, we've exercised that a lot with the White House. Um, uh, the chairman has sat down with the president and walked through it. I've sat down with the president and walked through it. Uh, we actually had a dinner conversation uh, about it, which was, um, uh, quite an interesting conversation over dinner. Uh, but it's important that our nation take that very seriously. And our, and the current administration, and it was uh, General McMaster that was leading it in the White House. I have no doubt that uh, Ambassador Bolton will take that on and continue it. Uh, took that very seriously and we, we worked things out, practiced then with them, sat down with tabletops, uh, me and the vice chairman, we went through it with the White House leadership. Uh, and then we exercise in big exercises with, in fact, this year, one time, the entire joint staff and the chairman got on the NAOC. Uh, we put leadership on uh, the airborne platforms to make sure that we're working those issues well. It's been a very good, uh, aggressive exercise, and, and we're not perfect, uh, but that's why we exercise. But I tell you what, the one thing that STRATCOM is good at, the, the, the thing that we're best at, is execution of the nuclear mission. If if you ever could get a clearance and walk into Stratcom and watch us do the nuclear mission, we if if there's any military mission that you can be perfect at, that's the closest one we come to. So we have challenges. We all, always want to exercise with the political leadership. That always adds a bit of reality. But if you want to watch a command exercise a mission, because we do it almost every day, because we never want to make a mistake in that mission. Well, we would love to come out and see you, sir. Thanks, thanks very, very much for spending this time with us. All right, thank you.